uh, welcome everyone to our community conversation on industrial aquaculture in Maine. Uh, I'm Matt Cannon. I'm the Campaign and Policy Associate Director here at the Maine chapter of the Sierra Club. And um, in addition to a lot of our advocacy work and organizing work in Maine, um, we started these community conversations at the beginning of COVID via Zoom. Um, so we're a little over a year here and they've been great ways to engage on important issues here in Maine uh, to learn more, to talk about them. So we're really lucky to have uh, two folks here who have spent some time thinking about aquaculture in Maine. Um, and we will, we were interested to hear what they have to say. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions, as I mentioned. So um, after they're done, we'll, we'll take questions from the chat and then we'll hopefully have a nice discussion here. So um, I'd like to introduce Jim Merkel and Jonathan Fulford. Jim, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks everybody for showing up and for being here with us for this time. And, um, you know, if you're in, I, I didn't notice uh, there's a lot of people on the on this call that I haven't met before. So I'm, I'm really glad you're here. And um, around Belfast, this whole topic of uh, industrial aquaculture is really a hot, um, a, a hot nerve to a lot of people. And because we've had just tons of hearings full packed with people and um, and so it's been a very divisive issue and I'm hoping that Sierra Club can play a role in really just helping inform people like why we have our position that we have and also listening to others who may disagree and respectfully having a conversation. And, you know, so today we really want to, um, you know, go into a little more depth of what our position is and Sierra Club National does have a policy. Um, that we have a Marine team plus also a food and ag team and they have um, had policies in place uh, longstanding and more recently been updating them. But you know, one of their biggest issues uh, why they oppose Nordic is that they, they support systems that are completely enclosed without any connection to the sea and that are completely recycling water and also polycultures where you have multiple species, not just a monoculture. And everyone knows the work, of, you know, over the, uh, you know, all the, uh, decades um, understanding the impacts of monocultures and huge CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. And um, the aquaculture systems do not look that much different than a huge pig farm or chicken farm when you look at inputs and outputs and raw impact. And that's to the ecosystem. So it's using the commons, our clean air, clean water, electricity grids, all those things. And it's using it also as a sink to throw pollution out. and you know, a lot of people have understood for a lot of years that dilution is not the solution. Even if you were to put this pipeline of Nordics way out into the deep ocean, there's still not, Sierra Club's not buying that. You know, just diluting pollution is not a solution. So, you know, there's some real clear reasons why the thinking has been as it is, especially when we get into shallow waters and estuaries where we are. Those are the most fragile ecosystems. In Belfast, you couldn't get close deeper into the estuary system than Nordic's proposal is. So it's in 35 feet of water and we have all these fish that are recovering. And so it's probably one of the biggest threats. Uh, and Maine would like to be a hub of aquaculture and they're promoting it with proposals in Bucksport, Goolsboro, Frenchman's Bay, Jonesport, Millinocket. And so I'll, I'll leave it at at that, and um, you know, I can expand a little more as we go, but um, maybe Jonathan will say a few words also, because he's been on the calls with me with uh, the national activists, grassroots, camp grassroots campaigners from across the country who've been working on these issues as well. Uh, do you wanna go there, Jonathan, and share a few things? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Um, and I'm ex excited to have a good conversation about, uh, about this issue. Um, yeah, I think that one of the other things that I think is really important in understanding um, what may what in certainly in my mind uh, is one of the biggest negative aspects of uh, this proposed project in Belfast, as well as uh, aquaculture in general, this type of aquaculture uh, is the climate impact. 
and so we um, really, when I say we really, Jim and um, and a couple other people, George Aguera, um, in particular, particularly did a lot of analysis of this proposal here as a case to look at with all the available information that we could get and did an analysis of carbon impact or climate impact per pound of protein produced is what we kind of boiled it down to. And uh, when you look at the uh, embodied energy of creating it and the operational um, carbon impact of growing a fish, it is a really um, unsustainable, a very unsustainable way to grow food for human consumption. And I think that for me personally, that is really the, the most um, damning analysis is, is this actually part of a uh, human a food system for, for human society that can move forward and still have a viable planet with our climate uh, crisis that we're in? And I think the answer is very clearly no. So, um, and I think even, and the net pen ones also suffer from, though not as much embodied carbon with building out this massive plant, the largest operational costs for the climate are the feedstock and the fish that meal that is used. And that, that in itself is reason enough, reason enough not to buy um, farm-raised salmon at this point with the food that they currently use as feedstock. And if um, we can talk more about that later. You know, any, any other food sources, wishful thinking, if you're actually producing it on a uh, commercial scale and there isn't, isn't another source that we're aware of. Yeah. Jim, back to you. Yeah, and um, you know, I got in, deeply in, involved in this issue in 1999 out on the West Coast. A professor who um, from the University of British Columbia had just bought a uh, a fishing boat, and um, him and I were actually going to kayak the entire coast. We're really good friends. He teach he, he was teaching sedimentology at UBC, but he's really into the ocean ecosystem. And uh, we ended up three months on a fishing boat, and we visited some of the um, whale and uh, ocean campaigners out there by sea and Alexandria Morton, for example, we had dinner with her and spent some good time with her. And at the time she was fighting aquaculture pens, the net pens, because she was befriending the fishermen and uh, the, so that she entrusted them. And then they uh, went to the aquaculture industry and said, look, here's, here's all our, our places. We really don't want the pens. These are really our great, our best fishing space spaces. And that's where they ended up putting all the pens. And so she lost the trust of these, uh, of all the fishermen that she'd been building relationships with. And, and um, if you look her up and you'll find that it's been a, a, a pretty brutal battle over the years. I mean, she's basically been taking salmon off of the supermarket shelf and testing them and finding disease in the fish that are going to market and putting known diseased fish into the pens out there. But people think that the pen solves, uh, the land base will solve the problem, but the big pipe that goes out into the sea is putting all that stuff that would be out, coming out of the pen, it's just putting it out. Even though, you know, some operations filter better than others, it's still like 13 times the Belfast city sewer in nitrogen, 13 times the nitrogen. And that bay is already closed for shellfish because of uh, algae blooms. So wherever we have a situation uh, and we have a closures, because of these uh, toxic algae bloom, which are driven by high phosphorus nitrogen, we shouldn't be adding insult to injury. And so they find this 11 year study up in um, Canada, Port Moulton Bay on lobster harvest, they find a 50% or greater uh, decrease in lobster near the pen. But the, but the reasons they found was the smell of the salmon basically disrupt the ability of a buried lobster who's on egg, uh, lobster on eggs to actually smell their food. They have to smell to find food. And if your whole world smells like salmon because of a big pipe or you're near a pen, you're not gonna be able to find your food and you starve. So they're talking 50, this 11 year study, this is not uh, this 11 year scientific peer reviewed study showing decrease in lobstering, uh, lobster catch. So there's a lot of unintended consequences and they find there's the lice are attracted to certain pheromones and chiromones from, uh, from the smells. So the big pipe that's coming out, that would be coming out into the base from these recirculating systems are gonna be attract a magnet for life. 
So any of you who know, if you put a bunch of apples out in your compost bin, you're gonna find every creature on earth wants to get there. So this pipe is gonna be a magnet for life. Any recovering salmon are gonna come around and they could get any disease that's coming out of that pipeline. And this will be, any monoculture is a basically a breeding ground for some of the most resistant strains of any kind of virus or disease. And, you know, Nordic has several pages of chemicals in their proposal that they would use. They say only in a very bad disaster, but it's all there, like 12,000 gallons of bleach is there in their proposal. So they're not hiding the fact that there's been mass die-offs and there has been all, up in Canada, several mass die-offs. There's been a big facility, hundred million built out in the Midwest and that went un, uh, bankrupt just in 19, uh, Vero Blue in, so they had it up and running and had massive uh, die off and uh, closed the facility. So it's not hypothetical that there could be really deep problems. So I do want people to throw any questions on the chat. I see, can you share your carbon impact analysis? And that's what I'll do now. So yeah, thanks. Um, I'll share my screen now and um, hopefully this is gonna work fine. And um, desktop. And while I'm share, while I'm doing this presentation, you know, if anyone does have questions about it, please do, you know, um, ask, and I'll uh, I can always give it uh, more detail. Or I don't want to go too slow here, but um, basically, on the first, the findings. This was done by um, myself. I'm a recovering engineer, and George Aguiar is a, is a friend from town who is uh, quite technical savvy. And he basically helped me uh, put this, the, the numbers together for um, evaluating in depth uh, Nordic aquifers as one uh, proposal. And so we have these findings that it would um, be equivalent to 4.6 to 6.4% of the entire Maine's 2030 greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas target. Um, and so doing something like this would when you know the Belfast, it would make it impossible for Belfast to meet their climate commitments, um, and you'll see why the, the carbon footprint is so massive. It's like adding you know up to 165,000 cars to the road, adding like five to seven Belfasts to our area, you know. And here we have the per capita carbon footprint of a, any one of us, you or I, on average across the United States, 16. Uh, metric ton of CO2 equivalents. The e, little e means you're adding in the other gases such as methane and uh, other gases that are sometimes much more uh, potent of a greenhouse gas to the equation. Um, so you see it, it's adding a massive footprint and our numbers are a little underestimated and we had no idea when we were doing this analysis, Nordic would not give us data. And we asked multiple times for their electricity and we, so we were assuming it was their generator capacity, which is eight, two megawatt generators. So we had 16 megawatts. And now a Nordic is telling us it's more like 28 megawatts that they'll burn and a whole new corridor is needed. You know, Mainers don't, Mainers don't have much of an appetite for corridors. And this would actually require this plant to have a 28 megawatt line, section 80 uh, reopened and all that $60 million worth of work would be essentially a subsidy to this corporation. You know, and Belfast as a community has signed two agreements and, and these agreements are to be in, a, in alignment with the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement. And so that means, you know, achieving a balance between, you know, humans generated and, uh, and, and what the actual ecosystem can sequester by the second half of the century. So that's meaning carbon neutral, achieve a balance. That means carbon neutral, zero carbon. To, you know, our governor actually signed even um, a more aggressive commitments here. And in front of the United Nations, Janet Mills, I watched her speech, it was quite beautiful. She says that the state is committing to be carbon neutral by 2045. So that means 45, um, you know, that means zero, 100% below 1990 levels by, uh, 25, by 2045. And so just a few other, you know, this other like unintended consequences when you um, 
uh, to the climate. Just if you're going to take a site like Nordic, uh, out in the West Coast, they chose an industrial site, uh, Samoa Point, that had been a pulp mill like Buck, Bucksport did. That was, you know, an industrial nightmare, but they are recovering it. And their pipeline, if they do build out in Eureka, California, Nordic's pipeline would be open seawater all the way to Japan, not in an estuary, deep, deep ocean water there. But here um, they're clearing, they, they would like to clear 34 acres. Now, if you study what the, the storage of carbon is actually in the roots. So when you, and the trunk, so it's about half above the earth and half below in the soil. So they are planning to remove between 15 and 48 feet of soil to build those tanks. Those tanks, when we started doing the, running all this data, you know, I'm not a recovering engineer, but when you put the weight of a tank into your farm, it's kind of a massive. And so Nordic's already had a lawsuit out on the, on, in Europe where in Denmark, where their tanks were sinking and they sued, Nordic did, but they lost their suit and they, uh, suing the contractor. So Nordic lost that and had to pay on not an, in, anticipating the weight of the tanks and the soil's ability. So that site, I've walked it tons of times. We go out there all the time. That it's a beautiful forest along the little river, but it's got 17 wetlands in it. If you wanted to build a house and find a perking site there, you couldn't find one. You know, if you said, let me just buy this and put a house here, you know, nobody would let you put a house. It's all wetland. It's not perkable, but it's beautiful and habitat and storing carbon. And so we did the calculations of 42. 0.9 metric tons of carbon per year. That's just what it sequesters. But if you cut it and dig up all those soils, you're releasing instantaneously all that carbon. So the assessment we did on Nordic was, uh, I'm quite used to doing these, what we call life cycle assessments. Where, as an engineer, I did many of these, uh, but when you get into ecology or system, it, you would do a similar thing. So all the embodied carbon on the left here in this diagram are all the things it takes to build a, a facility or an item, like if you're gonna buy a can of Coke or anything, the can has got embodied energy in it, you know, so, and the, the liquid inside you drink and it's, you know, gone through you. But this big facility has all this carbon from all the manufacturing, the building of the steel, the tanks, the glass, all the pumps, all the um, filters, all that. So that's added up along with removing tons and tons of soil and replacing it with gravel and paving areas and then building huge buildings and and then you're operating you have all the fish feed and the electricity to run all those pumps and it's massive the electricity is just massive and so if you think of two megawatt generators and eight of them that's like a small power plant that could run the central coast you know you could run a huge part of the central uh, mid coast with that and they in plan to run them you know, on a daily basis. But as early as 2015, uh, recirculating, RAS's recirculating systems have been identified as the most carbon intensive of all these different types of aquaculture. So like Sierra Club is not opposed to um, systems of aquaculture that are small footprint, but this is the most carbon intensive of all the types. And Nordic quotes in their literature, this analysis done, and we've been through this in detail. So they're combining, they're looking at this big red item would be to ship Nordic salmon all the way to um, Seattle by plane, putting the fish on a nice co cozy seat, you know, and <laughs> flying it across and having you eat it. Of course, it, you know, I'm, I'm being exaggerating, but it's a large, uh, bit of carbon as if that's our choice. Like in Maine, I can get a lot of seafood that's from Maine or the East Coast. So I don't have to, you, if you have a, a study and all you're doing is comparing their project to flying salmon from a Nordic pen, it's not really a good study. And so uh, I don't want to go and belabor that, but our analysis was more detailed. That was a good analysis in that it did do embodied carbon, but we did, three different uh, life cycle assessment tests. Um, actually, we used two calculators and then we actually uh, branched out to even a third just to make sure we were getting good data and that we weren't skewed. So we included things such as soil removal, import of aggregate, row building pipelines, loss of forests, building tanks, pumps, motors, filters, backup generators, 
and also the operational is electricity, diesel, glycerin, um, fish food. And our results are a little different. So if you look at the first bar, this is a study done in, on an on a operating facility in China. So we said, let's get that study. And it was peer reviewed. And that is, um, you know, a whole team of researchers did it and came up with the life cycle assessment of a car of a facility in China. And so that's this top bar. The second bar is the bar that we actually calculated um, um, use it, putting in actual data off of the drawings that Nordic has uh, made available to the public. And so you see the, blue, the light blue, which is the um, feed production is pretty similar in all these examples. It's a big footprint to grind up all this small food, fish from other places like Central America or Africa and ship them here for fish food. Those are, but those are, and they use uh, pig blood and chicken uh, slaughterhouse waste and GMO grains uh, and soy and grains. That's what the fish feed is. The blue, the darker blue you see is the embodied. So you see the China study accounted for a little bit more than what Nord, the third line here is the, uh, I mean, the fourth line is the uh, uh, Nordic uh, assessment that they've been touting for this, this, their land base, which would be the fourth line down. Um, our analysis came out to more than double what they had, had predicted. That was in 2016 and it was not built based on any built facility. So the, the China one is based on a built facility. Our analysis is based on their drawings. And the third is just a different calculator that didn't quite have all the input places to put in all the embodied carbon. So when we were able to put all the embodied carbon in, you can see the dark blue got much bigger. And you know, it's of course always an underestimate because you can't anticipate all the things that go into any kind of industrial facility. If you just go and look to buy like one system there and you go to go online and try to find all the parts to build one piping system and see how expensive all those parts are, it's, it's incredibly impactful. So what we're finding, and now if you look down the bottom here, you see wild sardines are a tiny footprint. They're 100 times smaller, 108 times smaller than eating caged salmon. And if you wanted to get like a, a haddock burger at a local uh, pub, you're still dealing with a very small uh, footprint. So we have a lot of beautiful seafood choices on the east coast of Maine that are low impact. And there is a bit of a misnomer being uh, propagated that the sea can't supply for this growing human population. Well, it can if we manage it well and use less and use it as a treat, use it less and always totally responsibly uh, harvesting from nature. So our recommendations really would be to demonstrate carbon neutrality. And in Norway, this project was three quarters of the entire Norway's industrial sector for 2020. One project would be three quarters of Norway's industrial sector of electricity, of, of carbon. Now the whole country has gone to a, a huge commitment um, for each sector to uh, become carbon neutral. And you look at their, pro their pro pro uh, progress been amazing. So this couldn't be built over there. And so, and then the application, we are saying they should use a brown field like say the people in Bucksport and it should be on stable soil and it should be a completely closed system. Then we wouldn't have this opposition. So I'll end there and um, uh, stop this share. And then I really do invite, you know, Jonathan wants to say anything. And if anyone wants to um, ask questions, you can type them in the chat and I'm really open to any question or challenging my data. As an engineer, I love people that challenge my data and find out because if you find mistakes in it, I'm happy because I want to never put, propagate a bad piece of information out there. So yeah, Jonathan, any thoughts or does anyone else wanna, um, uh, let me look at the questions here. Yeah, I saw one question that was asked about um, the money in aquaculture and in our marine um, uh, in, you know, industries right now in Maine. And I think that's, I'm not sure if I'm answering quite the question, but right now the, the, we have a very strong lobster fishery still. Um, I've heard different uh, different 
um, uh, getting a phone call. I'm off, have to be on my phone here. Sorry about that. Um, I'm here. I have heard differing numbers about the value of the lobster fishery in Maine, but somewhere around five billion dollars or something like that, as far as economic um, activity in the state of Maine each year. Um, I think that uh, the um, that that is a very strong part of our economy. It, doing things which jeopardize that is doesn't make sense. And so this. Um, because of the impacts of Penn stock, as well as this, the potential impact of the land-based ones, also um, with the outflow, you know, it seems like we need to be supporting the existing fisheries. The other one also is that um, the restoring, uh, if we want to restore really the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine and around the world to the health that, to support um, uh, wild caught fish, we need to be looking at our river systems and, and um, some of the dam removals we've had that have allowed much stronger herring runs and alewife and things like that. Those kind of um, practices really strengthen the entire ecosystem so that we have a sustainable fishery. And uh, because uh, I'm having to work off my phone, I'll have to- I, Yeah, I can check I'll it out. Down. And Jim, I don't know if you can read those too, but I think the other part of that question was you were getting to it, the alternatives, the state has to make money um, and kind of what are the other sustainable aquaculture farms, kelp, mussels, what, can you speak to any of those? Right, and um, you know, what I'm, around the world is so much aquaculture is happening and I happen to be filming over in India and um, also in Cuba and the people there are doing great, uh, small scale dip, like growing tilapia, for example, in polycultures where they have multiple species eating from one system. And a lot of these smaller systems are, um, they can operate and have, people can be profitable at, uh, without scaling up to this massive, massive plant. I mean, Nordic, from the first presentations they were giving us, they said they can only be profitable at this massive, massive scale. But when you get to that scale, I mean, Steve uh, Byers had asked a question here, you know, about what happens, uh, you know, when we have these big proposals, they take up all the oxygen in the room. For example, if Nordic was allowed, it is, ends up being allowed to build in, in Belfast, if someone else wanted to do anything that's gonna pump more pollution in, they just put in nitrogen equal to 13 times their sewer system. They took up all that capacity and more. The capacity doesn't exist even now to, for that water to be uptake. So when you don't have the capacity to even uptake what, we what we're putting in already, and then you add more, you're basically like the water's rising, you know? <laughs> so, you know, and Nordic has been playing a heavy in our whole state because we understand that they don't have title and rights. So I know the, you know, they don't have a right to the land yet they're, proceeding as if they have it and they're manipulating the public process all the way through. And it's, it becomes tough for citizens because we have several lawsuits ongoing and we've had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to stop them and to get them to do what's legally required. Like you can't just put a pipeline under someone's land who owns it. So, um, but they, you know, they are proceeding and they know that as if they can just get the political will at the state level to make this happen. And Maine as a state is putting out, we wanna be a hub for this industrial aquaculture. It's a return really to the chicken farm days. You know, someone recently did a paper that looked at, you know, if you had equivalent number of chicken farms, they'd be spread around 800 square miles of Waldo County, but here it's all in 34 acres, that same amount of effluent. And it's going to be going and the sludge now. So you got the pipeline of 7.7 .7 million gallons a day going out of the bay. But what about all the sludge? It's the concentrated. So, we, oh, yeah, we're filtering it. Yeah, well, you filter it, it turns into a sludge. Where does that sludge? It's a pond. They won't tell us really. They don't know where they're going to dump it. They say it's valuable. Well, who wants to put salty sewage on their crops? You know, I don't, you know, I grow all my food. I don't want salty. It's, you can't just easily get away, get rid of it. So, and in the winter, you have to truck it below the snow line is my understanding, because you can't spread this on sacrifice lands. You can find sacrifice lands to dump sludge that you want to get rid of somewhere. Someone will buy it and take it or, or let you dump it there for a fee. 
but Nordic hasn't solved that. And some municipalities are saying, like Bucksport has been like, well, maybe we'll put it in the sewer. And once you see what it takes for a sewage system to absorb that kind of nutrient load, it'll shut it down. It will not be able to sustain it. And it's going to cost the citizens a whack of money to try to make it do it. So, you know, I have a few other questions here coming in about dissolved nitrogen. And um, I don't have the numbers offhand, but the other thing beyond dissolved nitrogen is also the phosphorus. So they are, Nordic's claiming the phosphorus is being filtered, but it usually is reliant on filtering the solids because the phosphorus attaches to the solids, but certain fish foods that fish eat, will dis, the, the phosphorus will be dissolved and it won't be filterable. And so it could go as high as four times higher phosphorus based on their diets of what the fish are eating. And that's why the people in Belfast have been insistent on knowing what the fish food is. Let's see, um, the other questions, how did Nordic Farms pass all its permits and get past the Clean Water Act? Is, I don't know if Jonathan or Matt could, could help with that. That's, that's a challenging question. Um, we've been, uh, Upstream Watch has been working pretty hard uh, to try to make sure that the permitting process uh, meets all of the requirements as they are listed. Um, and it's been surprising to see, uh, from my perspective, a lot of clear requirements in the permitting um, not having to be met. Uh, sometimes with, I, apparently Maine has an exclusion from some of the Clean Water Act from years ago, I guess politically because of the, um, supposedly because of the influence of the paper mills back at the time um, on the, and the influence of um, our legislative delegation in writing the Clean Water Act in Congress that sometimes permits that would not be able to be issued in most other states can be issued because there's a, an allowance for basically meeting those, the, the uh, environmental requirements after it's already built um, where, and so that my understanding is that that is one of the ways in which some of these permits have been gotten through on a federal level. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I, I can't speak authoritatively there, but, um, and as far as on the other permitting, I, I, it's been a mystery to me sometimes why um, some of the requirements don't seem to be fully met and yet we're able, they're able to continue on. Um, the one that they seem to have stopped uh, been, has been uh, held up most completely with to this date is a title right and interest having to have actual legal access to the water for their pipes and that is being uh, fought in court. Uh, anybody who's been following this um, Nordic would know this and that is going to be resolved I think relatively soon um, is my understanding. So uh, you it, <laughs> My reading was you can't actually file a permit, you know, get a permit going if you don't have already established clear title right and interest, but somehow they were steps over that. Um, and uh, so now that has to be, that's being resolved in the courts as we speak. Now I see a question from Crystal Caney um, uh, about Protect Maine's Fishing Heritage Foundation and it's uh, 1.6 billion a year. And, you know, I would say that this is probably at the core of of this bigger issue of, you know, do we really want in Maine a legitimate working waterfront with lots of people at, at actually able to go out and independently make a living from the sea in a responsible, sustainable way and provide long-term wild caught fish in, in a responsible way to, well, I, I would hope not the world, I would hope to assume, but let's not, go back to volumes of fishing that destroy fisheries. But we see whenever we take out dams, even if you, uh, we go with our family every year to see the elwives coming up, like these tiny streams, like the Bagadoos will be a half a million fish. And in Belfast, all our rivers are plugged. Every single river has a dam blocking the elwives from, from migrating. And if we were to get them 
get some of these dams out, we could have a million fish possibly returning. And that's the base of the food chain. Most of these small fish are eating plankton and then they are the base of the food chain. When you take that out, all bets are off for having all these other fish, cod, salmon, you know, sturgeon, all these fish, we need the base of the food chain. So I think the position at this point in history, when every time we had a chance to regulate in Maine, we didn't. And then all of a sudden the pen, we kept having these ideas like, then we'll destroy that fishery, then the next fishery we destroy, then the next one, then the next one. And then pen, net pens were gonna fix that. And then they destroyed more than they ever solved. And now they think that putting it on the land is gonna solve it and it won't because it has too many unintended consequences. So we're looking to put another nail in the coffin of a dead fishery when, in my opinion, Sierra Club, it's not in my opinion, Sierra Club position is that we need to restore a system and have a, a fishery that's gonna be long standing and healthy and out into the way out in the future. And the only way we could do it is by uh, basically stopping, you're doing everything we can to avert climate change, which means not <laughs> adding places like Nordic and also protecting the fishery from disease, from um, these, uh, all the unintended consequences of attracting um, diseases to, to these pipelines and things like that. So I just wanna say that Sierra Club position is very firm and supporting a working waterfront. Um, Matt, are you seeing any other questions that we yeah, should- Yeah, there's, there's plenty. Thanks for everyone okay. for uh, participating. Keep them coming. We'll get to as many as we can before the hour. Um, there was one for you, Jim, about RAS being a viable technology. Are there running facilities that are working properly and financially solvent? Um, and there was a mention of a recent article by Mr. Hunt. Right. Well, you know, I what I've looked into is large, you know, RAS systems have been functioning for maybe 30 years and supplying hatchery size fish. And, you know, if you just want to grow the small fish, they, they grow them pretty well. And the people familiar with those who've worked there didn't see many problems with diseases, still would have problems. But as soon as you try to grow a fish there for multiple, to, to grow it out to a full size fish, then almost all of them have problems. You know, they have, uh, you know, they have to really fight and, and man manage everything very, very carefully to not have big outbreaks. So there have been multiple mass die-offs and really having a trouble understanding why. And the technology ends up by the end costing so much. It's a very expensive fish. It's not a fish to feed the world. You know, it's a very, very, very high-end expensive product. So to be financially solvent, you know, they can't compete with even net pens, which we shouldn't be doing, but they can't compete even with this, um, with low fish lower on the food chain. So, you know, some of what, you know, the scientists who like from Sierra Club, the, the marine scientists, you know, they're saying, you know, we should be eating lower down the food chain. And we should also, if we want to farm fish, farm down the food chain, not a higher up the food chain fish. Um, and then, and there are systems that are smaller scale that are functioning for lots of years with polycultures all around the world, polycultures are working. That just means poly means more, you know, you put species together um, and oftentimes even plants and fish will eat wastes even um, in certain systems. So it's a quite a cyclical system. Uh, so I think, you know, you could have small scale completely enclosed. There are small scale completely enclosed systems that um, are viable but in general, the Sierra Club is not supporting monocultures as a, as a principle of uh, the problems they introduce to, to any, any human system. If we want to think about, you know, COVID, I mean, you can't blame it on, but those viruses that jump from wild to human are from us basically confining wild creatures in these wet markets and things. And things happen that you can't anticipate. So as an engineer, you know, in my firm training, you always ask, well, what's the unintended consequence of anything you do? And with a big monoculture that's massive, you have a lot of unintended consequences. Can I uh, mention, there's one of the chat questions that's there that we did look into some around dissolved nitrogen. 
Yeah. And uh, my, my understanding is that as we were trying to do carbon analysis, uh, one of the inputs is a large amount of glycerin that is used and the water, wastewater treatment process. I am not a wastewater treatment engineer, um, but uh, our understanding was, was this was a um, technology to uh, actually uh, reduce the amount of dissolved nitrogen. So even with uh, the best available technology um, there, the calculations for the amount of dissolved nitrogen that was still going to be released into the bay were as high as our study shows um, uh, and is kind of based on Nordic's uh, information, uh, trusting that to be accurate, but it is, it is using um, best available technology with the dissolved nitrogen with this adding glycerin in the wastewater treatment process to um, really so larger or to tie up and actually turn a lot of the dissolved nitrogen into, into N2. So um, uh, in spite of that, still the nitrogen load into the bay um, was going to be ex extremely high. That's, that was my understanding of how we read the analysis. Um, um, uh, see, and I'm looking through. Yeah, I can um, guide a few. There's there's a lot, there were a couple uh, comments on specific amounts of nitrogen per day that I saw, um, ammonia. So feel free to talk to those, but the right. next. Well, yeah, and you know, the, the, the idea, the problem with the nitrogen and uh, a lot of it has to do with the circulation. Like if Nordic was out at say, um, I don't wanna push them somewhere else really, but their plant in Eureka, or even if they went out to Owl's Head where you have 200 feet of water, I'm a sailor, so I'm sailing these waters all the time. And where their pipe would be, I would say I sail home from <laughs> most, uh, quite frequently in the summer with the tailing wind, a well, wind behind me coming into Belfast Harbor. And if you think of um, the tide coming in and the wind blowing 14 knots behind you, that water from that area is gonna make it all the way up under the bridge. There's just absolutely no way it's not gonna make it straight into Belfast Bay because the pipe is really in Belfast Bay. When Nordic runs their models, they calculate the volume of Penobscot Bay and they say, we're dissolving into this. And you look at their, their very uh, crude study they did, well, the circulation is very complex. Um, new, yeah, the, the, the studies done on the three levels, like the top level of water, the middle and the lower level, they do different things throughout the season based on the salinity and the, the, the num amount of fresh water coming down from the Penobscot River. And also the wind can uh, change the direction of the water out in that bay off of uh, Islesboro. So the direction it's gonna flow is contingent on many things throughout the season, salinity, the winds and temperatures, and it's complex. And it, it's more or less gonna go back and forth, back and forth a lot is what's gonna happen. So it's, it's not gonna just flush out to sea. And uh, so that nitrogen could really be a problem. It could go right by the beaches of um, Bay, Bayview and be something very unattractive to swimmers and unhealthy for them. And it could, it's gonna come straight into the Belfast Bay. And um, if you say nitrogen isn't a problem, some people say, well, possibly dissolved nitrogen isn't a problem. Well, we do have it. Uh, current fish, shellfish closures over much of Maine's coast. Much of it is, if you look at the maps, you'd be surprised how many areas are closed to uh, uh, toxic algae bloom. And it is someone else common, and it, it is also the ammonia. So there's a lot of compounds that uh, come out with fish uh, growing that are below the pens when you have the pens. And also when you have the pipe, it's the same thing as a pen, it's just the pipe is just a concentrated instead of it dispersing into the ecosystem, it's coming out in one big three foot pipe. All right, those are, thank you for those. Uh, there's one, I think it's a quick answer. Jonathan, maybe you know, influence Sierra Club has on legislation. Um, I know there's one piece of legislation to add climate impact to the Public Utility, Utilities Commission. There's also another bill to add climate impacts to department decision-making. Um, so those are the two I'm aware of that we're following and working on. Jonathan, there are others, do you know? Yeah, th those are the ones I'm aware of too in this legislative session that would have uh, direct impact. One of the things to know is that with the work that was done on creating a, um, a climate 
impact assessment that George and Jim worked so hard on. And we tried to submit that. Uh, um, uh, that was uh, to the Department of, Part of Environmental Protection and the Bureau of Environmental Protection in the licensing permitting process. And it was stricken from the record and considered not part of the environmental review of Nordic is what is its climate impact. And so they never had to um, publicly uh, defend or even state what their climate impact truly would be and have a, uh, and nor could we submit ours and kind of say, this is our analysis. This is what it's based on. Um, I would love to have seen construction drawings and actual detail of um, all, instead of having to interpret the, the relatively simplified drawings, which we had to base this on and the analysis that was done uh, with the Chinese study as well. So we were working with the best available information we had, but you know, if there is legislation that required the DEP to have to use climate impact as part of the basis of any permitting, we would have actually been able to make Nordic um, uh, disclose, or at least we could have sued them to make Nordic disclose the climate impact instead of them just you know, saying, oh, this is how low it is and have no real hard data to base up those claims. And uh, I think it, the, the silence, which they never actually challenged any of the details of the carbon analysis we did, I think speaks volumes. If somebody actually had good data that would have given better outcomes than the one that George and Jim was able to um, create, I think they would have been happy to do so. But because I think we actually did significantly underestimate the climate impact um, and therefore the carbon impact per pound of fish uh, grown. Uh, but we were wanting to be conservative, not um, and very defendable in our in our calculations. Um, so I th that would that legislation would have great value. It's possible that that legislation won't pass. It's also possible that it'll be only used to regulate um, the DEP and um, not the DEP, excuse me, um, uh, Public Utilities Commission instead of actually DEP and all their agencies. So if you would like to make sure that every agency in Maine when they are making considerations um, of how they spend their money and what projects they approve has to include an analysis of the climate impact, then that legislation is something to support. And that's a pretty, I think a pretty uh, exciting uh, change to the main um, regulatory environment if that was to pass. And I don't remember the bill number. Uh, I would guess, Matt, you're pretty on top of that. Do you remember the bill number for that? Uh, I just put one of them in the chat that's been printed about all agency rulemaking. And there's the other one for the Public Utilities Commission that has not been printed yet. Yeah, and I, I would like to invite James uh, Haskum to say a few words. I know he's, uh, I, I saw him in the chat, wanted to speak to the issue a little bit. So James, if you want to unmute yourself, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so my name is Jim Hanscom. Um, I'm a lobsterman, fisherman, scholar, shrimper, halibut, tub trawler, everything from Bar Harbor. I'm also the Zone uh, B vice chair on that council. I also am the vice president of the Lobster 207 um, Lobster Union here. Um, so we are getting ready to deal with this in Frenchman's Bay. I just sat in on a town council meeting two weeks ago with the three guys and their attorney that, you know, is proposing this stuff. And they're, they are proposing a massive facility um, up here. And so for me, I know that 207, Lobster 207, the MLA, you know, Maine Lobsterman's Union, they're heavily invested right now in, you know, opposing what's going on in your bay, in Penobscot Bay. Um, I feel like our Bar Harbor Town Council is not understanding what's going on um, at all. Uh, and you guys seem to have a good grasp, you know, of what's happening. Of course, I'm a lobsterman, so I got problems with salmon pens, windmills, and whales. Um, things that we might agree, might disagree on, but we can agree on some stuff. My, my main question was, and I'm just not very good at typing stuff, was the Earlier in the meeting, the data that you, you, you were posting up on your page, Jim, the, just the carbon footprint stuff and all that, is there a way for me to 
could you get that to me? Can you email that to me? I would love yeah. to have that. I have a very close friend, uh, Valerie Peacock is her name. She is a town council member for the town of Bar Harbor. And she, her thought process is like 150% in line with all of you folks here for certain. Um, and I'd love to be able to get that information to her um, and then go on to the Bar Harbor Town Council. We're, we're obviously in a unique situation because the site, the proposed site is actually in the town of Goolsboro. Um, but it's really truthfully in our wonderful, beautiful, pristine Frenchman's Bay um, that none of us want to look at it. But this group is coming at the town of Goolsboro, which is a little more challenged. You know what I mean? Economically promising jobs. Um, they're making big promises about the old Stinson's canning factory in Prospects Harbor and promising to acquire that facility if these lease agreements are granted. And then they're saying they're going to, you know, promote a couple hundred jobs, you know, and, and everybody's buying it. You know, I personally am not buying it. So um, pretty much that's all I really want to say is that there is a group of us that are here in another bay, you know, that are staring down what you're staring and any information that I could, you know, get from you guys just to maybe pass on to our town councils and people involved. Um, that's a really nice display of information, what you had said. And I think that information that you posted, I have a town council that would respond to that. They would see the, the whole green footprint, so to speak, you know, it would, I, I feel would, would weigh heavily with them. Can I, can I speak to that just a touch? Um, uh, when you look at that analysis, you'll see that the embodied carbon of building a land-based one is pretty severe, but the largest carbon footprint is actually the operational carbon and the largest operational carbon is the feed. And that is the same, whether it's penstock or land-based. Um, and, and, you know, I think from a, from a, um, water quality and ocean health standpoint, penstock is worse. From a climate impact, uh, land-based is worse. Neither is sustainable, neither is good. Um, so it's an interesting, um, and they both have negative in impacts on climate, and they both have negative impacts, these you know, semi-open systems to the bay as well, with both water temperature and you know, the discharge and the and the nitrogen and phosphorus and uh, viruses coming out of the discharge as well with these semi-open systems. So I, I don't, I can't, that's why I think Sierra Club is pretty clear that, you know, the analysis so far is there is no current commercial um, proposals in the coast of Maine that I've seen that would any, come anywhere near meeting um, the environmental standards necessary to support um, uh, from an environmental perspective, support any of these developments. And the other one also is to take in on a kind of a global scale, not just the climate impact, but when you are these fish feeds that these pen stock and, and closed and semi-closed systems are using are primarily based on fish that are being caught off of West Africa and off of Peru, some of the last really strong viable fisheries. And my understanding is they're being hammered by these, um, this this industry and you know the last thing we need to do is strip out some of the last viable fisheries you know on this planet and we need to instead be focusing on ways in which we have sustainable fisheries we support that in all the ways necessary on a global scale like it is you know that you, know, you know you're underwater you know it's like it doesn't end it's it's all one ocean really and uh, we need to take care of all of it in order to make all of it work well so and we just got about two or three minutes left and so uh, James, I de um, definitely put you, maybe put your email in the chat and I'll get to you that stuff. And I want to say, if you need me to come over there any time to meet with people, I am happy to. And, um, you know, Sierra Club is going to take a position against the Frenchman's Bay, I'm quite sure. So, I mean, we're looking at it right now. We have a committee and we've been talking about it. But the more we talk to you guys, the better, because you're on the ground. And just I know people want to know what to do. And right now there's the thing because Nordic seems like they're flying through, but uh, what they need to hear from is people, I think Janet Mill's office and the Economic uh, Development Office of Maine needs to hear, and uh, the newspapers, you know, when um, they've been printing, whenever you can send a letter to the editors of any of our papers, that's helpful. And um, I know there's uh, some legislation right now to regulate 
aquaculture is a little better um, coming up. So pay attention to that. But I would say right to mills and um, and Jonathan, anything else that you can think of that people can do right now to support? Uh, um, no, stay involved. Uh, stay, you know, stay informed. There's lots of ways which we as citizens um, uh, can have a much larger influence and voice in the outcomes of things both in Augusta and nationally, but also particularly in our local towns. So um, local elections matter, um, who, who, and so does having your voice heard respectfully, um, putting your understanding of the issues out there and um, making sure that you know you stay engaged. It's, uh, we can make sure that um, we shape the future in a way that's sustainable if we all participate. So thank you for all of your, you wouldn't be on this call if you weren't interested and engaged. So thank you for the work you already are doing. And I just want to give a shout out, like I'm reading through the chat and I'm seeing Ellie and Kate and a lot of other people have put a lot of great comments in the, in the chat. So I, I think Matt's going to save that chat. And um, if any of you can want to save the chat, just on your bottom right corner, the very bottom, you have a little three dots and you can save the chat. And so we, you can um, see what others were contributing to this conversation. There's been a lot of people in our community working tirelessly for like three years trying to stop this. Multiple lawsuits, five, six organizations founded just to stop this uh, main turning into this uh, industrial hub of, industri of agriculture. Um, and we really feel certain that this is a time to restore our fishery, as Jonathan said. And, so I want to thank everyone for coming on the call. I mean, it was uh, great to meet all of you too. Yeah, thank you all. And I'm not sure if you can save the chat, but we'll follow up with some of the materials and some of the comments. And it seems like we need a part two because um, there were a lot of great questions and sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but clearly there's some momentum here and um, stay tuned. We'll keep you updated and we may reach out to many of you. Um, for organizing support. So thank you again. Stay tuned for our Earth Day events coming up in a couple weeks. You can get there on our websites, um, sierraclub.org slash main. And thank you all again. Really appreciate it.